Hello and welcome to Reading with Carrie, Stories to Fall Asleep to, a mindfulness podcast series that can be used as a sleep aid or to ease your anxiety and relieve your stress. I am your host, Carrie Favel, and I am so thankful that you've decided to spend some time with me. I hope you're enjoying the theme for season three. Today's episode is about Libra, and Libras are born between October 31st and November 22nd. Libra is an air sign, and the actual symbol is the scales, but it's also called balance. Libra are extroverted, charming, and friendly people who are concerned with attaining balance, harmony, peace, and justice in the world. They tend to be frank and persuasive at times. I naturally wanted to tell a story of the imagery of finding work-life balance, and during my research, I saw that the best example of a fairy tale with this message is the tortoise and the hare, which I have already read on this podcast. Many fairy tales have the protagonist finding justice in the end, but how about peace? Well, I've got you covered in today's story. So for today's validation space, I was looking at the idea of peace and the antithesis, which fits the myth that all people with a mental illness are violent. I'm going to read an excerpt from Medical News Today, and I will leave a link in the description if you'd like to see more from them. They respond with this fact. The idea that all people with a mental illness are violent is, of course, a myth. Thankfully, as the world becomes more aware of mental health conditions, this misconception is slowly dying away. Even individuals who are experiencing the most serious conditions, such as schizophrenia, are mostly nonviolent. It is true that some people with certain mental illnesses can become violent and unpredictable, but they are in the minority. The authors of a review that investigates the links between mental health and violence help explain why this myth might have gained traction over the years. Quote, Violence attracts attention in the news media. Violence in the context of mental illness can be especially sensationalized, which only deepens the stigma that already permeates our patients' lives. End quote. The authors of the review conclude that individuals with mental illness, when appropriately treated, do not pose any increased risk of violence over the general population. The overall impact of mental illness as a factor in the violence that occurs in society as a whole appears to be overemphasized. Although there certainly is a relationship between violence and mental illness, one author explains, quote, Members of the public exaggerate both the strength of the association between mental illness and violence and their own personal risk. In a commentary that appears in The Lancet, Sir Graham Thornicroft, a professor of community psychiatry at King's College London in the United Kingdom, discusses the public health implications of this thorny matter. Outlining the inherent oversimplification that this myth implies, he writes, quote, People with mental illness are much more often the victims of violence rather than the perpetrators. He continues, However, people with some types of mental disorder are more likely to be violent than others in the general population, a fact that is uncomfortable for many in the mental health sector. While there is little evidence to suggest that people with mental illness in general, usually those with diagnoses of depression or anxiety disorders, have any increased risk of perpetrating violence compared with the general population, higher rates of violence perpetration have been identified among people with particular types of severe mental illness, namely schizophrenia and bipolar disorder." End quote. However, Sir Thornicroft explains that these rates are only moderately raised compared with the general population. He writes that rates of violence are significantly raised in people who have triple morbidity. For instance, individuals with a severe mental disorder, a substance use disorder, and an antisocial personality disorder. This excerpt was written by Tim Newman on October 5, 2020, and fact-checked by Jessica Beek, Ph.D., So I know that was a long excerpt that I read, but this is one of the most harmful stigma stereotype myths out there, and I just wanted to be very cautious about how I approached it, and I liked having the backing of someone who's already researched it and discussed it in full. 
I know several people online, so they're not close friends, with bipolar disorder. And uh, while my own mental health was really bad there for a few years, I felt I might have had borderline personality disorder. I did go to a therapist to express my concerns, but she was very standoffish and pretty much told me I just needed to think about it some more. So unfortunately, my experience with therapy has not been great, but I do advocate for people to seek therapy because I know it takes a while to find the right person that you can feel safe and comfortable with confiding in, but it's worth it. Luckily, my primary physician was able to prescribe me the medication I needed, and with that medication, I'm able to control most of my issues through mindfulness meditation and honesty with myself, trying not to dwell on negative thoughts and having a support system. So things are not perfect. It is a daily struggle, but since I've kind of taken the reins of my own mental health rather than getting swamped and drowning in the symptoms, I've felt it's easier to control and some of the symptoms that I associated with borderline personality disorder have kind of faded away or or lessened. I still have some of the characteristics but it's more manageable now and I don't think I'm so impulsive in a way that is detrimental to my health and safety. That is big TMI but again I, I want to help with the mission to destigmatize mental health awareness and talking about it. A lot of people suffer and I think it's time that we admit that. But enough of that, the validation space turned into a whole validation venue, so I think we're done with that one right now. Before we begin with the story, let's start with a mindfulness meditation. And I have decided to pre-record this and insert it. I just think that it will be more advantageous for you as the listener. I can always do my mindfulness meditations alone at a different time. Close your eyes and take a posture that is relaxed, taking care to keep your back and neck in alignment. As you get situated, really notice your body, feeling the weight of your body on the chair, the bed, the floor, or wherever you may be in this moment. Notice the position of your feet and any sensations you can feel with them. Locate your legs and the blunt pressure on whatever seat you are on. Feel any sensations in your arms and make sure your shoulders are soft. Where are your hands resting? What are they feeling? Acknowledge any tension that you feel in your muscles and allow your body to express itself, being present in the moment. Just be aware of the tension or whatever may be happening in your body. Simply note the communication with a simple thought of, I hear you, that's how it is right now. Bring your focus to your breath, but don't alter it in any way. Just feel your body's natural rhythm as you inhale and exhale. Feel the oxygen enter your lungs, that slight hitch between inhale and exhale, and the sensation of the air exiting your lungs with another micro moment between breaths. Let's extend our awareness to our mind. What thoughts or feelings or perceptions are present right now? Again, we are just noting these thoughts and feelings in this moment. Don't try to push or shut down any sense of discomfort or unpleasant feelings, but don't dwell on them either. Simply validate them with a simple acknowledgement, such as, that's okay, that's how it is right now. Keeping the connection you have with your body, reach your hands above your head, stretching your arms. Tense up the muscles as you breathe in and hold them in place for just a moment. And now, as you release the breath, relax your muscles and place your arms back to where they were resting comfortably before. Let's repeat this once more. Raising your hands above your head, tense your muscles in your arms and shoulders as you breathe in and hold the position as you hold your breath for just a short count of four. Then release your breath as you release your muscles 
and rest your arms back to where they were. Now focus back to your breathing and notice how you can relax by taking slow, deep breaths in and releasing your breath slowly out. Breathe in, hold your breath, and breathe out slowly. Breathe in and out. Keep breathing deeply, gently, and slowly. Now notice your whole body as being present. Be aware of every part at once as best you can as you continue to softly and deeply breathe in and out. If you are preparing yourself for bed, continue to breathe in and out and just listen to my voice, but do not follow. If you need to ready yourself to get back to your day, then let us now widen our spatial awareness by using our other senses. What sounds do you hear in the room other than my voice? Are there any smells you can recognize? Feel the item on which you are resting with all of your body and imagine it in your mind. Try to picture it as accurately as you can without opening your eyes just yet. And now, take a deep breath in on an inhale of four. Hold your breath for a count of four. And on an audible sigh, release your breath as you open your eyes and fully come back. And now, here's the story. The Stones of Five Colors and the Empress Jokwa. A story of the sun, the moon, and an empress all working together for peace. This is an old Japanese fairy tale that does not have an author attributed to it. However, it was translated and compiled by Ye Theodora Ozaki. Long, long ago, there lived a great Chinese empress who succeeded her brother, the Emperor Fuki. It was the age of giants, and the Empress Jokwa, for that was her name, was 25 feet high, nearly as tall as her brother. She was a wonderful woman and an able ruler. There is an interesting story of how she mended a part of the broken heavens and one of the terrestrial pillars which upheld the sky, both of which were damaged during a rebellion raised by one of King Fuki's subjects. The rebel's name was Kokai. He was 26 feet high. His body was entirely covered with hair, and his face was as black as iron. He was a wizard and a very terrible character indeed. When the Emperor Fuki died, Kokai was bitten with the ambition to become Emperor of China. But his plan failed, and Jokwa, the dead Emperor's sister, mounted the throne. Kokai was so angry at being thwarted in his desire that he raised a revolt. His first act was to employ the Water Devil, who caused a great flood to rush over the country. This swamped the poor people out of their homes, and when the Empress Jokwa saw the plight of her subjects and knew it was Kokai's fault, she declared war against him. Now Jokwa, the Empress, had two young warriors called Hako and Eiko, and the former she made general of the French forces. Hako was delighted that the Empress's choice should fall on him, and he prepared himself for battle. He took up the longest lance he could find and mounted a red horse and was just about to set out when he heard someone galloping hard behind him and shouting, Hako, stop! The general in the front forces must be I! He looked back and saw Aiko, his comrade, riding on a white horse in the act of unsheathing a large sword to draw upon him. Hako's anger was kindled, and as he turned to face his rival, he cried, Insolent wretch! I have been appointed by the Empress to lead the front forces to battle. Do you dare to stop me? Yes, answered Aiko. I ought to lead the army. It is you who should follow me. At this bold reply, Hako's anger burst from a spark into a flame. Dare you me thus? Take that! And he lunged at him with his lance. But Aiko moved quickly aside, and at the same time, raising his sword, he wounded the head of the general's horse. Obliged to dismount, Hako was about to rush at his antagonist when Eiko, as quick as lightning, tore from his breast the badge of commandership and galloped away. The action was so quick that Hako stood dazed, not knowing what to do. The empress had been a spectator of the scene, and she could not but admire the quickness of the ambitious Eiko. And in order to pacify the rivals, she determined to appoint them both to the generalship of the front army. 
So Hako was made commander of the left wing of the front army, and Eiko of the right. One hundred thousand soldiers followed them and marched to put down the rebel Kokai. Within a short time, the two generals reached the castle, where Kokai had fortified himself. When aware of their approach, the wizard said, I will blow these two poor children away with one breath. He little thought how hard he would find the fight. With these words, Kokai seized an iron rod and mounted a black horse and rushed forth like an angry tiger to meet his two foes. As the two young warriors saw him tearing down upon them, they said to each other, We must not let him escape alive! And they attacked him from the right and from the left, with sword and with lance. But the all-powerful Kokai was not to be easily beaten. He whirled his iron rod round like a great water wheel, and for a long time they fought thus, neither side gaining nor losing. At last, to avoid the wizard's iron rod, Hako turned his horse too quickly. The animal's hooves struck against a large stone, and in a fright, the horse reared as straight on end as a screen, throwing his master to the ground. Thereupon, Kokai drew his three-edged sword and was about to kill the prostrate Hako. But before the wizard could work his wicked will, the brave Aiko had wheeled his horse in front of Kokai and dared him to try his strength with him and not to kill a fallen man. But Kokai was tired, and he did not feel inclined to face this fresh and dauntless young soldier. So suddenly wheeling his horse round, he fled from the fray. Hako, who had been only slightly stunned, had by this time got upon his feet, and he and his comrade rushed after the retreating enemy, the one on foot and the other on horseback. Kokai, seeing that he was pursued, turned upon his nearest assailant, who was, of course, the mounted Aiko, and drawing forth an arrow from the quiver at his back, fitted it to his bow and drew upon Aiko. As quick as lightning, the wary Aiko avoided the shaft, which only touched his helmet strings, and glancing off, fell harmless against Hako's coat of armor. The wizard saw that both his enemies remained unscathed. He also knew that there was no time to pull a second arrow before they would be upon him. So to save himself, he resorted to magic. He stretched forth his wand, and immediately a great flood arose, and Jokwa's army and her brave young generals were swept away like a falling of autumn leaves on a stream. Hako and Eiko found themselves struggling neck deep in water, and looking round they saw the ferocious Kokai making towards them through the water with his iron rod on high. They thought every moment that they would be cut down, but they bravely struck out to swim as far as they could from Kokai's reach. All of a sudden, they found themselves in front of what seemed to be an island rising straight out of the water. They looked up, and there stood an old man with hair as white as snow, smiling at them. They cried to him to help them. The old man nodded his head and came down to the edge of the water. As soon as his feet touched the flood, it divided, and a good road appeared to the amazement of the drowning men, who now found themselves safe. Kokai had, by this time, reached the island, which had risen as if by a miracle out of the water. And seeing his enemies thus saved, he was furious. He rushed through the water upon the old man, and it seemed as if he would surely be killed. But the old man appeared not in the least dismayed, and calmly awaited the wizard's onslaught. As Kokai drew near, the old man laughed out merrily, and turning into a large and beautiful white crane, flapped his wings and flew upwards into the heavens. When Hako and Eiko saw this, they knew that their deliverer was no mere human being, was perhaps a god in disguise, and they hoped later on to find out who the venerable old man was. In the meantime, they had retreated, and it being now the close of day, for the sun was setting, both Kohai and the young warriors gave up the idea of fighting more that day. That night, Hako and Eiko decided that it was useless to fight against the wizard Kokai, for he had supernatural powers, while they were only human. So they presented themselves before the Empress Jokwa. After a long consultation, the Empress decided to ask the Fire King, Shikuyu, to help her against the rebel wizard and to lead her army against him. Now Shikuyu, the Fire King, lived at the South Pole. It was the only safe place for him to be in, for he burnt up everything around him anywhere else but it was impossible to burn up ice and snow. To look at, he was a giant and stood 30 feet tall. His face was just like marble and his hair and beard long and as white as snow. His strength was stupendous and he was master of all fire, just as Kokai was of water. Surely, thought the empress, Shikuyu can conquer Kokai. So she sent Aiko to the South Pole to beg Shikuyu to take the war against Kokai into his own hands and conquer him once for all. The Fire King, on hearing the Empress's request, smiled and said, That is an easy matter, to be sure. 
It was none other than I who came to your rescue when you and your companion were drowning in the flood raised by Kokai. Eiko was surprised at learning this. He thanked the Fire King for coming to the rescue in their dire need, and then besought him to return with him and lead the war and defeat the wicked Kokai. Shikuyu did as he was asked and returned with Eiko to the Empress. She welcomed the Fire King cordially and at once told him why she had sent for him, to ask him to be the generalissimo of her army. His reply was very reassuring. Do not have any anxiety. I will certainly kill Kokai. Shikuyu then placed himself at the head of 30,000 soldiers, and with Hako and Eiko showing him the way, marched to the enemy's castle. The Fire King knew the secret of Kokai's power, and now he told all the soldiers to gather a certain kind of shrub. This they burned in large quantities, and each soldier was then ordered to fill a bag full of the ashes thus obtained. Kokai, on the other hand, in his own conceit, thought that Shikuyu was of inferior power to himself, and he murmured angrily, Even though you are the Fire King, I can soon extinguish you. He then repeated an incantation, and the water floods rose and welled as high as mountains. Shikuyu, not in the least frightened, ordered his soldiers to scatter the ashes, which he had caused them to make. Every man did as he was bid, and such was the power of the plant that they had burned, that as soon as the ashes mingled with the water, a stiff mud was formed, and they were all safe from drowning. Now Kokai the wizard was dismayed when he saw that the Fire King was superior in wisdom to himself, and his anger was so great that he rushed headlong towards the enemy. Eiko rode out to meet him, and the two fought together for some time. They were well matched in a hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hako, who was carefully watching the fray, saw that Eiko began to tire, and fearing that his companion would be killed, he took his place. But Kokai had tired as well, and feeling himself unable to hold out against Hako, he said artfully, You are too magnanimous thus to fight for your friend and run the risk of being killed. I will not hurt such a good man. And he pretended to retreat, turning away the head of his horse. His intention was to throw Hako off his guard, and then to wheel around and take him by surprise. But Shikuyu understood the wily wizard, and he spoke at once. You are a coward. You cannot deceive me. Saying this, the Fire King made a sign to the unwary Hako to attack him. Kokai now turned upon Shikuyu furiously, but he was tired and unable to fight well, and he soon received a wound in his shoulder. He now broke from the fray and tried to escape in earnest. While the fight between the leaders had been going on, the two armies had stood waiting for the issue. Shikuyu now turned and bade Jokwa's soldiers charge the enemy's forces. This they did and routed them with great slaughter, and the wizard barely escaped with his life. It was in vain that Kokai called upon the water devil to help him, for Shikuyu knew the counter charm. The wizard found that the battle was against him, mad with pain, for his wound began to trouble him, and frenzied with disappointment and fear, he dashed his head against the rocks of Mount Shu and died on the spot. There was an end of the wicked Kokai, but not of trouble in the Empress Jokwa's kingdom, as you shall see. The force with which the wizard fell against the rocks was so great that the mountain burst, and fire rushed out from the earth, and one of the pillars upholding the heavens was broken so that one corner of the sky dropped till it touched the earth. Shikuyu, the fire king, took up the body of the wizard and carried it to the Empress Jokwa, who rejoiced greatly that her enemy was vanquished and her generals victorious. She showered all manner of gifts and honors upon Shikuyu, but all this time fire was bursting from the mountain, broken by the fall of Kokai. Whole villages were destroyed, rice fields burnt up, riverbeds filled with the burning lava, and the homeless people were in great distress. So the empress left the capital as soon as she had rewarded the victor Shikuyu, and journeyed with all speed to the scene of disaster. She found that both heaven and earth had sustained damage, and the place was so dark that she had to light her lamp to find out the extent of the havoc that had been wrought. Having ascertained this, she set to work at repairs. To this end, she ordered her subjects to collect stones of five colors, blue, yellow, red, white, and black. When she had obtained these, she boiled them with a kind of porcelain in a large cauldron, and the mixture became a beautiful paste, and with this, she knew she could mend the sky. Now all was ready. Summoning the clouds that were sailing ever so high above her head, she mounted them and rode heavenwards, carrying in her hands the vase containing the paste made from the stones of five colors. She soon reached the corner of the sky that was broken and applied the paste and mended it. Having done this, she turned her attention to the broken pillar and with the legs of a very large tortoise, she mended it. When this was finished, she mounted the clouds and descended to the earth, hoping to find that all was right now. But to her dismay, she found that it was still quite dark. Neither the sun shone by day, nor the moon by night. 
Greatly perplexed, she at last called a meeting of all the wise men of the kingdom and asked their advice as to what she could do in this dilemma. Two of the wisest said, The roads of heaven have been damaged by the late accident, and the sun and moon have been obliged to stay at home. Neither the sun could make his daily journey, nor the moon her nightly one, because of the bad roads. The sun and moon do not yet know that your majesty has mended all that was damaged, so we will go and inform them that since you have repaired them, the roads are safe. The empress approved of what the wise men suggested and ordered them to set out on their mission. But this was not easy, for the palace of the sun and moon was many, many hundreds of thousands of miles distant into the east. If they traveled on foot, they might never reach the place. They would die of old age on the road. But Jokwa had recourse to magic. She gave her two ambassadors wonderful chariots, which could whirl through the air by magic power, a thousand miles per minute. They set out in good spirits, riding above the clouds, and after many days they reached the country where the sun and the moon were living happily together. The two ambassadors were granted an interview with their majesties of light, and asked them why they had for so many days secluded themselves from the universe. Did they not know that by doing so they plunged the world and all its people into uttermost darkness both day and night? replied the sun and the moon. Surely you know that Mount Shu has suddenly burst forth with fire, and the roads of heaven have been greatly damaged. I, the sun, found it impossible to make my daily journey along such rough roads, and certainly the moon could not issue forth at night, so we both retired into private life for a time. Then the two wise men bowed themselves to the ground and said, Our Empress Jokwa has already repaired the roads with the wonderful stones of five colors. So we beg to assure your majesties that the roads are just as they were before the eruption took place. But the sun and the moon still hesitated, saying that they had heard that one of the pillars of heaven had been broken as well, and they feared that, even if the roads had been remade, it would still be dangerous for them to sally forth on their usual journeys. You need have no anxiety about the broken pillar, said the two ambassadors. Our empress restored it with the legs of a great tortoise, and it is as firm as ever it was. Then the sun and moon appeared satisfied, and they both set out to try the roads. They found that what the empress's deputies had told them was correct. After the examination of the heavenly roads, the sun and moon again gave light to the earth. All the people rejoiced greatly, and peace and prosperity were secured in China for a long time under the reign of the wise Empress Jokwa. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support this podcast and become a sponsor, you will find an Etsy link in the description below. Thank you for your consideration. I welcome you back anytime you may need to hear a comforting voice or a familiar bedtime story.